You know full well I've owned some really patchy hardware over the years, but this one might just take the cake. It's a Dolch portable system. Hello everyone, I'm a high trick. Jeez, I really need to adjust the white balance on that. Well, sorry, it's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll ignore it for now. So, yeah, we're going to have a look at that thing. i got some stuff to say, but I'll say it at the end of the video because it's unrelated. So, yeah, this, this Dolch portable. If you want to see it running, look for someone else's video because I'm not going to be running it here. Not going to happen. Uh, and if you don't like people yelling, well then go away because I'm probably going to yell a lot in this one. Let's just get on with it because I can't bother to stand here all night. I'm hungry. I want to go and eat something. This thing is an absolute enigma. The form factor immediately grabs my attention of being out of place and out of date, utilising the upright bread bin design more akin to the 1980s than was contemporary for this machine's time. Yeah, this is what I call a bread bin, not that Commodore 64 which people masturbate to. I've never understood that. It looks nothing like a fucking bread bin. The hell are you smirking? The Dolch has one good thing going for it from the start. There's a handle up there, and it's a nice big one. But we're going to come back to this in a moment. You mark my words. Now the handle are these two buttons, which let the keyboard flip down. There's no pointing device, but it probably wasn't needed in this machine's application. There are little notches in the front of the chassis that these pegs slide into in order to hold the keyboard in place. And you can adjust things farther with these flip-out feet on the bottom of the chassis. I don't know what this cap's for, presumably to let lost screws or magic smirk out of the machine. Behind the keyboard is a nice big LCD screen, but it has a 640x480 resolution. It's a colour display, and it is active matrix. It seems to have decent response times, and the colour was good too, I suppose. The only adjustment for the screen is a brightness slider by the indicator LEDs. Obviously there are logos dotted around. I don't know who iNet are, and don't much care to be honest. Feel free to look them up if you want to. I think the machine probably was manufactured by Dolch, but has been rebadged by iNet as a Spectra. Now back to that damn keyboard, and this is where we have our first major problem. What the fuck is this? Talk about another throwback to the 80s, but even then a lot of 80s machines had gotten rid of this crap already. This is an absolute disgrace. It's not comfortable, and I want to know why they even found the damn thing so late on. You see, you'd think this was an older machine, but it was made quite late into the year 2000, so why on earth they fit this archaic, noisy piece of crap to it evades me. And it's simply unacceptable. Why not use rubber derms like everybody fucking else, you dipshits? I can only guess it wasn't meant to be used very often, and that they had a bunch of them left over from two decades prior, possibly returns of other machines, as, well, we're about to see what this thing's made of in good time. It even has that old-timey coiled telephone wire sticking off the back of this keyboard, which, yeah, these things always age well. I'm amazed this one's still in one piece and doesn't just snake around all over the instant it's let loose. Before somebody asks, that's what the buttons look like under these on this stupid keyboard. Uh, horrible, horrible things. Uh, lots and lots of lateral motion in them, which is a bit hard to demonstrate. There's a lot of travel, but it's weirdly soft. Like, less resistance than you get on domes. Really don't know why they didn't just use domes. Very silly. Would not want to write a novel on this, and I'm not exaggerating because I have written a novel on a Satellite Pro 410 CDT that, well, isn't small, so, I mean, it's not huge, but I really wouldn't want to do it on this. So I'm not just, like, dragging that out my arse. It is a thing I've done, and I wouldn't want to do it on here. This, anything but the occasional button press. The, the first resistance you meet is when the key hits the bottom. Really, really uncomfortable thing. Even by mech keyboard standards. I just can't stress that enough. It's horrible. Now you might have noticed in these shots that the back panel wasn't on the machine, but these holes were for the two COM ports, a parallel port and the power supply. 
On one side there's a floppy drive and a bunch of vents with a fan behind them, which isn't very powerful, but I guess it's good enough. The bezel around the floppy drive there was only glued in place and has come loose with age. So that just looks fucking wonderful. That's really the sort of thing I would expect in an expensive device like this. You know, upon further inspection, I don't even think there was any glue there, and it was always just flapping like that. What a crap. On the other side, there are card slots and an exhaust fan that's part of the power supply. But yeah, we got a lot of card slots, so I mean, it shows promise. But why is the panel off anyway? Well, because I replaced the innards of the system. You see, originally it came with this TMC AI5TH motherboard. And you've seen a few TMC boards on my channel. I guess this proves that they were going into expensive stuff. In this system, the board came with 64 megs of EDU RAM. It's not parity, which I'm surprised at. And it also had a Pentium MMX200, a perennial processor that I have no real love for, but at least it's not the 166, which makes a change. Now, this motherboard wasn't without its own set of problems. Firstly, I can't repair it because this Dallas RTC module isn't socketed, and it's placed in such a way that I can't even grind holes in to battery mod it. It's dead. It also isn't really viable to desolder this module, it never seems to work out. So, really, the board's basically useless at this point. It will at least boot if you press F1, it's not one of those that gets stuck in a startup purse loop, but you can't change any settings, and I need to just to install an operating system, so, well, yeah, good luck. The motherboard is somewhat noteworthy, though, as ones bearing the 430HX chipset from Intel aren't very common, and they used to cost a lot of money. And so you'd think, if Dolch or iNet were going to fork out for one of these boards, and I'm not really sure why they did, it's an absolute mystery, answers on a postcard, please, that they'd at least make sure to install the damn thing properly. But no, this is one of those few Socket 7 boards that really is dual rail and capable of running Socket 7 chips. However, they had the jumpers set to single rail voltage, basically leaving the motherboard in Socket 5 mode, and as we know, the Pentium MMX is a Socket 7 chip. That needs dual voltages. Then Jesus Christ, whatever's gonna go wrong next? Now my bloody audio's going out. I've seen photos of other such machines like this one, and it seems to be where they left the thing, in the single rail setting, which is bad. If you own one of these, you need to change that, because the 2.8 volt part of your Pentium MMX is going to be running at 3.3 or probably 3.52 volts, which obviously is way out of spec, and it'll probably melt the damn thing. Some people did this and got away with it for years, but it's got to have some kind of negative consequence. You know, it's almost as if they wanted the damn thing to fail, because they used this crappy heatsink. It's just a sheet of what seems to be composite. It's too rough to be plain aluminum. It feels strangely fibrous. It looks like the hull of a cheap little rowboat or something. It, it was simply glued to the CPU on this tiny little strip along the edge. It wasn't even on the whole die surface, or IHS, the, the heat spreader, I suppose. And it was held in place with a bracket that had no possible mechanism for release. That's basically underneath the heatsink anyway. So it had to be destructively removed, which rounded the pin on the CPU socket. So this motherboard would probably never be used anyway, even if I could fix the damn thing. Unless you want one of them crap heatsinks that clips around the edges of the processor. Unfortunately, I didn't realise at the time that the floppy disk drive's power leached off of this fan. Oops, I guess we won't be having a floppy disk drive in this thing now. Among the original internals were these cards. This machine was a network sniffer. It came with no hard drive. I can't get the software. I can't get the accessories. So as much as I'm like to, I'm sorry. We can't test these and we can't see what they do. I would imagine the labels on the keyboard have something to do with whatever software they needed. Interesting little parallel bus they have going on, hanging off the side there, though. I guess the ISA bus just couldn't keep up or something. Hey, dickhead, you still didn't tell us why the back panel's off. Well, that panel is off because it won't go back on. You see, the way this thing was built is utter trash. A bunch of foam and double-sided tape held everything in place. But you know what was well-engineered? Anything that was designed to prevent the system being serviced and fuck over the technician. Look at those damn bolts up there. Look at them. They're hardcore, but they're hardcore trash. These bolts come through the handle mounts, through the outer casing, and into the chassis, where they, they've obviously tapped threads for them or something. It holds the chassis in place. The only way to get to them is to destroy the handle. 
This, taking this off is the only way to get the screen module out. And unless you use blunt force like I did, that's the only way to take the motherboard off due to bolts coming through from the screen side. Getting to that board itself is already a chore due to the way the hard drive bay and power supply kind of fold together. This is where our problem is. Here, the, the power supply won't fit because the RAM is in the way. If you use almost any motherboard other than that TMC, things get in the way of the pissant little power supply and the system can't be reassembled. There are also ferrites down there which can catch on things, that square one particular. The corners can get jammed and gouge bits out with the PCB. Goodbye motherboard if that fucking happens. I hope you didn't want to use that keyboard. Oh well, we didn't. It might be doing us a favour. You might have noticed behind the power supply and drive there, there's these little copper bits all over the place, and these fall off. I can't even tell what they were held on with. It cut my hand. I want to know what the failure rate of machines is for these falling out when the damn thing was in use. It may not have escaped your attention that the power supply is at the bottom of the chassis when the system's in the correct orientation, and the motherboard's upside down to match. So hey, fuck you, Ravenstone, or was it Silverstone? Yellowstone? Whichever. Y you got beaten to it at the fucking... It's the same goddamn price range as our cases used to be. Fucking overpriced trash. You know, there's something odd down there in that corner now, the keyboard control. That these connectors, which went to the screen unit and attached to the PS2 header. I don't know what the fuck they're supposed to do, as they don't seem to use the data pins, and nothing happens if you don't connect them. It isn't powering the LCD, because that apparently comes from the VGA card itself. You see, rather than use the feature connector for the video signal, it relies on this Chips and Technology 65548, which has its own LCD controller built in. Of course, it means that you have to use this card, and you can never change it in this system. Now, this card both drives and powers the screen. And call me paranoid, but I really don't like the idea of power being drawn off of this thing. I'm almost certain this VGA solution wound up in laptops. It almost certainly would have done, probably to Shebas, as it seems they had a massive contract with chips and technologies at some point. I mean, they were they were fabric. I mean, they were fabricating the chips for them, so you'd think they must have got along quite well. I'm sorry, I'm yelling. I actually quite like chips and technology stuff. Uh, well, at least someone at Dolch obviously realised shorts were a potential issue, as they put plastic sheets on the back of the card. Hope the glue doesn't become conductive with time, although the cables get squished up and squashed and pinched so bad that you're probably still just going to short something on the edge of the power supply when the outer insulation breaks down. Also, there's practically no RAM on this card, but it doesn't really matter in the system's intended use case. But then I say that, and I think these ran Windows 98, so actually... I can't imagine performance was very good, even for such a thing as this would do. It would get rather annoying. And is at the premium price, you'd think maybe they could have got something better by the time it was built. It's almost as if they just threw it together with whatever they had lying around in an old warehouse and bought a job lot or something. Now, getting the new motherboard in wasn't easy, because it doesn't really fit, and the standoff seemed to only be built for that one TMC board. So I had to make my own holes, at the risk of drilling into the screen. Now, if only I'd known it was a waste of time, I might not have been so bloody careful and just used a power drill. I suppose we should test the TMC board's performance, at least, if only for the 430HX chipset. You see, 430HX boards seem to be rather sought after for some reason, but as far as I can tell, they're not really any better than the 430VX, aside from more casual RAM being allowed, that you'd never really use, and SMP support that, again, you'd almost never use, and not many boards have it. This one sure as shit doesn't, it's a single socket, so why the hell is there a HX on here? But back on the cache, we do see vias for a curse stick, which would explain that jumper we've observed on TMC's curse modules in the past. This board only has 256k soldered to it, and you can do nothing to change that, aside from maybe disable it if you really want to for some reason. EEPROM flashing maybe, I don't know. The Terratech Maestro needs you to disable it to be configured properly a lot of the time. They don't mention that in the manual. If you own one of those and it's not working out when you're trying to configure it, turn the damn cache off, it'll probably work. We won't be running the Pentium MMX in here, but instead a Pentium 90. And the S3 Trio 32 video card. Why? So we can compare it to those boards that we tested a good while ago, which were in the same configuration. Well, it seems about right is all I can say. I'm not even going to fucking read that out.
I can see no real gains or losses over a standard 430 VX board. This thing's utterly pointless. As expected, you only really need a 430 HX for some niche applications, and they're probably just not worth paying for otherwise. The VX boards are easier and cheaper to get hold of, and there's more of them. They just make logical sense. And I've set out to own a HX board myself, it just came with the machine. I guess it'll make a nice display piece, maybe, if I had walls that I could actually screw something to instead of this one third inch of cardboard. Now draw your own conclusions, I guess. I'd never tell you not to buy such a board if you really, really wanted one, only that there isn't much point otherwise beyond the sheer novelty of it. Which is something I'd certainly understand. It's not like I don't own motherboards that are utterly stupid, which I'm fairly certain you could form a very robust argument against earning. Yeah, maybe we'll see one of those someday, but I'm sure as hell not in the mood right now. What can certainly not be debated, however, is that this portable is the most expensive paperweight I have ever earned. This one was way cheaper than many of the others you see out there, in part because of the RTC being broken and some other issues. I'm quite glad of that, but it still cost a lot of money, and it's totally useless. I had such great plans for it. The fact that it takes standard AT motherboards and peripherals had so much potential. You might remember my gripes with the Toshiba T6600C, and this thing could have been everything that that system should have been. But no, because of the utterly retarded design philosophy of it's our way or not at all, screw the technician, the potential for greatness is completely ruined, as you're left with a pile of trash that was already configured incorrectly, designed to fail from the factory. It has a one-way assembly that is certainly meant to prevent servicing. It has an unusually low resolution screen for the time, with a god-awful scaler attached to it that barely works on a video card you can never change out. It has a dated and uncomfortable keyboard that's practically useless, there are almost no redeeming qualities, and any that do exist are so grossly overshadowed by the countless missteps by those who design a damn thing deliberately to fuck the end user over that you would never notice them in the first place. Avoid these systems at all costs, unless they're completely free. But if you do find one in your hands, be warned, and I am seriously warning you, you will waste a lot of time and lose your patience for absolutely no reward whatsoever. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. And that's it. I've had enough. Fuck this. This thing's going where it belongs. Back to that prick in front of the camera. And that's that. What a piece of crap. It can go out on the piss pile where all the other garbage went. Like my DX7 that I had. Yeah, I tried to sell the DX7 I owned. No one fucking wanted it. So say it's the most popular synth ever. I had to throw it on this trash pile that's at the end of the road because we don't really have garbage collection here very often. And I, I couldn't transport it to the city dump. I just had to leave it on there. You know, so that's gone, so that's probably where that'll go. Uh, we'll keep some of the bits out of it. I'll probably keep that motherboard just because the HX is unusual. But otherwise, I don't think there's anything worth saving in there. It's, it's pretty horrible. Maybe I'll try and see if anyone wants to buy a power supply on eBay. It's a doubt they're very common. And they probably break because they don't seem to be very strong. And well nothing else in there is particularly well made so that probably isn't either and that one's still working or it was it's probably broken by now now i don't know what else to say about other than it's garbage and for what they cost just don't bother just buy a desktop or something and like duct tape a screen to it like it would work and then you could put a proper keyboard on it as well instead of that piece of shit because that is an utter disgrace for the year 2000 that really does baffle me. I, you know, they should have already been over 20 years out of date by then. So, well, at least 10 years out of date. Sorry. Time gets weird as you get older. It's uh, your, your sense of, your perspective of it changes. I think it's like when you walk to the shop, it always seems quicker walking back. Uh, is the best way I can describe it. So as more years go by, time seems short. It's like, well, it can't have been that short a span of time. But it really was. It's a bit rubbish, but uh, yeah, uh, we're never going to see that again unless some miraculous thing comes to me I can get it to work, but it won't even go back together. No, no boards I have will fit, and I don't really want to drill more holes in it because it's only a matter of time before I go through the screen. I'm sorry I didn't take the board out for you, but 
I just want to get a video done. I had three videos scripted, which depended on me filming outside, which I never fucking do. And that was my three month set. I'm like, I'm way ahead. I'm going to get way ahead on videos because I'm filming back to back and I'm never ahead. I'm always behind. And then pandemic goes off and now I can't fucking do it. So yeah, uh, everything else I've tried has, has fucking gone wrong. Like this thing. Uh, which is why I decided, well, fuck, I'll just make a video on it anyway. Why do things always have to work in a video? It can be broken as well. Uh, another machine I was trying to build uh, ended up, like, it's, it's happening. It's just slow. And um, my 386 I needed for something, and it wasn't working right. It kept locking up. I thought it was a capture card. I'm still not sure what the issue is. CPU keeps getting locked in protected mode when nothing sets it to protected mode. I assume it's some obscure bug, I prodded chipset registers around, reseated things, in the end it started working but I didn't change anything, I literally looked away from the machine to read something, hit the reset button and it just worked, so when I go back over there in a few minutes, uh, it probably won't work again, <laughs> but if it does keep working then that gives me another video I can do with uh, some rather crappy hardware that no one ever talks about and probably for good reason. Uh, otherwise I want to do some different stuff here, uh, there's a cartoon series I said I'd review years ago, you probably know what it is, especially if you're in my Discord, because I've just not shut up about it for fuck knows how long, uh, I guess we'll maybe talk about that, maybe have a look at, <laughs> I, I sort of joked in a response to someone like, you know, we could have a look at a shitty two-stroke bike, maybe we'll have a look at that, it could be quite fun, uh, you know, why, why the fuck not? But yeah, I'm definitely behind on this one, aren't I? Well, I don't have a schedule. I try and aim for one video a month, but it never seems to work out. Especially not there's just all this shit getting in the way. And you can see what I've had to contend with. This damn thing. And of course now I can't get parts for anything else, so... That's kind of bad. Uh, it's, it's just the way things are, but... God damn, man. I'm seriously, I'm pissed at this thing, because it was expensive, it cost me a lot of money. Like, it didn't cost anywhere near as much as they usually sell for, because of the, the lack of hard drive, and the, the RTC being bad, and just some scuffs and crap like that. But, yeah, you know, I thought the T6600C had some really silly design decisions, the construction of that isn't anywhere near as bad as this, but it's still a bastard to work in. Yeah, th this thing really takes the cake, and by 2000 I'd expect things to be a lot better. A lot of parts in there are made in 98, so they're obviously binning things from long ago when they built it, but it's, it's just this weird mishmash. It's like they've just built it, whatever they had. But weirdly, I can't be sure on this, because uh, obviously, like I said, they're expensive. I'm not sure I really have been there. It gives me the vibe of it's like those late Zenith machines, like where they're absolutely horrible, but you can tell it used to be a good company for making these. And I cannot but wonder if their older machines were better. Uh, there's certain things there that suggest to me at some point they maybe had a really good design and they just fucked it up. If anyone has a, a really old one, then you know, let me know if that, that's it, or, or were they always just crap? You know, I don't really see them around, no one seems to own them, and I can't recommend owning one. They're uh, absolutely terrible, like I say, I, I'm not even kidding, I'm just going to throw it out, because there's, there's no point in having it, it takes up a lot of room, it's never going to be useful, so unless something comes to mind where I can come up with something weird, maybe have a board that takes RAM on an angle, but that still wouldn't fix the connector placement, so I don't know, I just, I don't think it can be made useful. The one thing I will say, if you do have one and it's working, then you could probably see where my SCSI card was in. That was so I could use a CD drive, but uh, obviously I never got that far, so whatever. Uh, I really have no else to say on this one. I really don't. You, there's the gist of things. I'll try and get some videos done. I don't know if I will, and I don't know when, as always, especially with the way things keep going when I try. It's like it's jinxed. Hopefully we're proud of that now. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't, but I'm out of battery anyway. I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, I'll see you later, and remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 622 up. Well, I don't think you can do that on one of these fucking things, especially not since I cut the floppy cable out without thinking. Eh, who would have thought they did that? Why leech a fan, you morons?
surprises me made in USA because pretty much everything else I have with that written on it is of exceptionally good quality. So thankfully I know this is the exception to the rule. I mean, come on Dolch, you're letting the USA down here. It's small wonder manufacturing ended up going over to China because, well, they'd be dead proud of this thing.